Welcome to the Ball Over Passion Roundtable podcast. <laughs> Today is our opportunity to sit down with the fans and just talk about football and footballing only. Um, I'm with the usual guests, actually hosts, I should say, CK and George. And today's topic is about scouting. Now, I know this is probably George's and um, CK's favourite topic. So, you know, I'm excited to hear what they say. Unfortunately, we're missing one of our, you know, favourite members, Curran. Um, yeah, he'll be back next week. But, you know, for now, let's just make do. So, how are you guys doing? Good, mate. Good. Not too bad. How about you, CK? How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I wasn't here on the on the live, but I'm here now, man. Yeah, I mean, let's get started. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, get an insight from you guys. You know, there's there's obviously the transfer windows, you know, we're in the middle of the transfer window. We're looking at players to sign. We're, we're looking at potentially different systems, different different positions to sign and you know we all have we all have our own different ideas of you know who we want to sign so let's let's talk in general ck first of all before you look at any position what is the main thing you look at um, in, a player? in general for a player i would probably look at their physical attributes so like height speed um weights and like mass not mass but like their body type and then mm -hmm for like in for certain players it changes depending on the position so like goalkeepers yeah. defend generally taller than your midfielder and depending on the type of striker the height varies so definitely physical attributes and then in mental attributes it just look like if they work hard for the team stamina and stuff like that so it's it's, it's very similar attributes for specific positions but there are certain things mm -hmm. that are different when you're going in depth. Mm -hmm. So is there is there a general um, blue, um, blueprint that you, you set for these players, regardless of position? or Yeah, yeah because there's it's always more so in comparison to other players in their position when I scout. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to the... Say I'm scouting a player for a specific... For Arsenal, because that's the team mm -hmm. I support, I would look at what the team actually needs rather yeah. than what that player is because if there's no point in scouting players they aren't useful to you yeah um, yeah sure um george do you have anything to say about that or yeah i'm uh really particular with how i i have a like a little blueprint that i do no matter what the player i mean we all look for special qualities on specific positions but Generally, I always have eight games that I'm going to be watching um, for any player that I want to make a decision on. So typically okay. I start with, um, you know, the title challengers of their league, home and away. I then start with, you know, a top four um, kind of rival if they are in the top four or if not just a top four team in general, home and away. Um, then I look for a relegation battle, uh, home and away. And if they have a derby or a, a rival themselves, um, and if they don't, I just substitute for a mid-block team within the league, home and away. So that's kind of my eight-game analysis. No matter what player, what league, whatever, if I'm trying to give my approval on a player, I always do that. I also have a little mental uh, checklist that I do. So typically, no matter what player that we're talking about, I always look at how players start to begin the half and to end the half. The first 15 minutes are really important for me on either side. And of course, the first five minutes after a mistake, um, those become really key to me in terms of how can they deal with pressure regardless yeah. of the position. And I start to build a almost mental checklist. And I substitute that with a lot of interviews typically too. I do um, look at maybe four or five interviews just to jot down. I mean, sometimes yeah. players can give you some really key insight in terms of how yeah. they actually function as a player. Like what they value says a lot about them. It's not just the normal, I do my work for the team and whatnot. But typically, if, even if you're an attacker or a midfielder, what they value lends me into their instincts. This is really what I like too, because we're kind of, we're humans, right? So we do give you little tells in terms sure. of what we're like. And I can normally predict a player more likely either to track back or not, depending on their interviews too. So yeah, I, I combine those two broad strokes for game state. And then, yeah, I'll break it down. 
um, down into qualities, you know, when, um, when we'll get into positions. But I do that for every player, and I don't really change that on youngsters to adults, really. I carry the same blueprint. I, I'm more forgiving in youngsters where I typically give them up to the age of 23 with 50 appearances in their favorite position before I'm final on them never reaching that. But generally speaking, I kind of follow that eight game blueprint along with that yeah. mental checklist. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that sounds that sounds pretty interesting. I mean, what would what would be the key point that you look at a player and you say, yes, he is probably going to be in that world class category. Forget numbers, forget you know how he performs on the pitch. Let's say in terms of you know his mental capacity, and how he you know puts himself out there. What do you think? You know, just just gives you the the president where you're like that guy's world class or he's going to be world class. Yeah, you know, uh, somebody that's not afraid to um, talk about their weaknesses. Um, I, I find typically, you know, um, somebody that, you know, obviously if you go back and they're not afraid after making a mistake, that's a really key thing for me. If they're still doing the same traits, you know, they don't change their technique based off a mistake. That's That's really important for me because if you change your technique, it says to me that you're unsure, you're not confident or authoritative in your play. And, you know, for me, that's a, a big sign of really a world-class player. If you look through, world-class players are unfazed about any kind of mistake that they make. And in fact, they're they're never afraid to talk about them quite openly. I mean, when you look at some of the greats of the game, Ronaldo's, your Messi's and whatnot, you know, they will always tell you where they can improve. And they're not really afraid about that aspect coming out. And for me, being self-aware like that is just the crucial maturity step that you look for in any real player. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, for me, it would probably be those little mental checks. And, of course, making a mistake. It would be different for keepers and, you know, attackers or whatnot. But the idea that they're not afraid to do that within five minutes of making that mistake in front of a packed crowd says a lot more to me on their mentality if, that again it doesn't phase them you know and uh, uh, if they don't change their technique I think that's very key I find that those that change their technique are unsure a lot of times so uh, yeah I think that's it for me yes CK do you have anything to add to that yeah I do agree on the point that looking at a players interviews and that is, is a good aspect to them because I can give an example of one player that we're looking at is that Madison who when a player knows their deficiencies and actual qualities, it's very positive because they, it just makes them easier to coach because them and the coach can actually know and identify what they actually need to improve on. And for a player to be overall aware of how they are, it, it's only positive for the player themselves because they, they'll be able to adjust and adapt to situations in game, out of game, in new environments and stuff like that. So for me, a player being aware is a definite positive. Another thing I look at in particular in a game is like how a player reacts after like a yellow card or their team conceding or their team getting a red card because certain players shy away after getting a yellow card because they just don't want to risk it. And when a player isn't able to risk it, it like for me, it puts them down a level because in a top team or in any team, you need those being able to put it all on the line for you. Because without that, then in certain situations, you just won't proceed. So for me, being able to overcome a barrier like a yellow card or your team getting a red card <laughs> is definitely a positive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. I, 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 never, I never thought of it like that, to be fair. I mean, for me, it was... For me, I'm always a numbers guy. I think we've had our discussions where, you know, I've always said, no, but look at his numbers. He's got 15 goals in 15 games. You know, that guy's world class. But then, you know, just listening to your conversations, you're, you're, you're pretty much right. Because there are players like Bruno Fernandes who, you know, he has the numbers. But when you look at his mentality in some big games, he's completely, he's not there. He's not there to, you know, stand up for his team. And that goes a long way. That goes a long way in big tournaments, you know, in tour in in games where you need your big players to drag you to, to the finish line, you know, and if they're not hiding, then you know, you know, those players, you know, have not only have the ability to be become world-class, they also have ability to become, you know, 
champions because they've got that mentality. But that's <laughs> that's pretty interesting. You know what um, it is, Z? I just want to yeah. tag on in terms of what you're you're saying here because for me, look, as a coach, what I recognize is that we're dealing with elite athletes here. Okay, like yeah. if you give a football player time and space, they can show you world class traits from the championship. You know, if you give the right environment to certain players, they can world class skill. So for me, it becomes how, how reproducible is that skill in different phases of play and how reproducible is it in different environments? And to me, that becomes a mental question where if, if you don't rely on specific stimuli to produce that skill, then for me, you're world class in, in that sense, because that's normally the mental aspect that I can distinguish between all world-class players. They're unfazed in terms of environment. They just produce the skill and technique on on show, uh, no matter a mistake, no matter the environment, no matter things going against or for you. Um, and I think that's the key cog about reproducing things because anybody, and I, I think this applies to your job too. You know, you see these these people that, you know, maybe are book smart or and maybe not street smart. You know, we see this um, kind of in everyday life. So for me, that becomes a real critical part of, you know, scouting a player and making sure that, you know, these players can do that skill, but reproduce it. It's not so much as showing it because I feel as though yeah. you can see that from players because they're world-class athletes. We really do forget, you know, I think when they put out those training videos and you've got like Declan Rice and everybody doing these like little F2 freestyle stuff and you kind of think, damn, like these guys are crazy you know even Rashford who says you know he doesn't have a big touch and you see him sky a ball and kill a ball dead you know with no pressure like these these are world class where the margins are so small you can't almost just look at absolute output you got to look at kind of the the factors that might change that output maybe not just in one season but you know many I mean it goes to show as well when you look at these South American athletes as well They've come up. They've come through from the worst upbringings you can even imagine, and they are mentality beasts. They come into the Premier League with their talent and their mentality, and they flourish. And some of the best players in you know in Europe have been from South America, and it goes to show just because purely the mentality has dragged them through straight to the top. So no, I completely agree. Um, I think we're going to go to the next stage of the podcast. Well, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to dissect you know the discussion into four different segments in we're going to just talk about goalkeepers center halves i mean defenders midfield and attackers so let's start with the goalkeepers i think you know goal, goalkeepers has probably been one of the biggest topics for you know our favorite clubs arsenal we we have bird leno who probably doesn't meet every metric that we want you know but He's not that bad for me in terms of shot stopping, but you know, nowadays football is not just about shot stopping. Some people would even say we don't even care about shot stopping. We want our goalkeepers to be able to kick, we want our goalkeepers to be like midfielders. So, I mean, I'm going to give this to you, CK. What do you want? Do, what do you want in a goalkeeper? What is your favorite thing about for goalkeepers? Me, like, goalkeepers is, is, is a bit different to everybody else because they don't, they don't have a partner so. With them, they're lonely. So, when something does happen to a goalkeeper, it's all it's, they're all in themselves. So, concentration and mental toughness is is a big thing for goalkeepers. Because if a goalkeeper is like naive or gets caught in a mistake, you will suffer for the rest of that game. And when a goalkeeper makes a mistake, nine times out of ten, it's going to end up in a goal. So concentration levels is definitely a big one. Obviously, shot stopping has to be important because they're your last line of defence. So if a keeper can't save a ball, then what's the use of them being there? Um, nowadays, kicking is a massive thing because goalkeepers generally start all your build-up and are involved in play rather than just moving it long. So their short passing, mid mid-range passing, long passing is all important. And some of the best keepers in the world are excellent on the ball and rarely get caught out so kicking is another thing that i look at and command the, the penalty area so like coming out for crosses yeah communication with your defenders one-on-one -on -one ability are all big things and decision making is the last thing for me because you see a keeper a prime example who is a world-class goalkeeper in edison sometimes you see him get caught in no man's land and with bad decision making and positioning 
that doesn't happen. Is there is there anything um, that you probably want to see in a goalkeeper probably in the future that you know you don't see right now? I mean, we, we've got to think. We've got to be ambitious because you know what? Five years ago, when I was looking at players like Chesney, I, was, I didn't even think about that a goalkeeper would have to you know be able to kick. Because I remember him, well, he made his debut against Manchester United and he couldn't kick a ball to his save his life. And he even came out and tweeted, "Sorry, Arsenal fans, I don't know how to kick." <laughs> I don't know how to kick. I'm going to be tra- I'm going to practice. I'm going to be practicing that. But now it's become so, you know, it's it's become so advanced to the extent that we need our goalkeepers to be able to have midfielder like qualities. So mm-hmm. what next? What happens next? Well, in our goalkeeper, Ben Lennon, number one, he is a a, qual- a very good shot stopper. That's something I give mm, to him. Yes. I think he lacks that mental toughness and confidence and concentration that I was talking about. Because the, I think that Leno is a is a confidence person in the sense that if he's not confident, he'll be he'll be you'll see many poor performances from him. Whereas other keepers have that mental toughness that I'm looking for, and the kicking is something Leno hinders us with because his kicking isn't very good, and he kicks long, which is against the instructions of the the manager, which always have effects on the on the system. So in the future for Arsenal, I'd love to see a keeper who is much better on the board than Leno and has that mental toughness he lacks, even if it does decrease the shot stopping a bit, because Leno is a great shot stopper. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you give this to you, George. What's your favorite thing about you know the modern goalkeepers? You know, what do you want to see in an Arsenal goalkeeper now? Look for me, um what CK said about them being on their own, I really don't think it's said enough. Like the, the mental aspect of play and sports psychology is never more apparent than in a goalkeeper than any other position. You know, they, everyone jokes about the goalkeepers union. And if you're ever part of a team, they are their own clique and weirdos. They have to be kind of unhinged. And I need, and I actually need that in a keeper. You actually have to be crazy to be a keeper. You need to be, you're going to be put in situations where it's a total individual claim. You know, you can't rely on having a bad game to have somebody else bail you out. Like you can have that in any other position in the sport. And there's typically players that, you know, you can rely on your team to bail you out in deficiency, but in a keeper, your mistakes are left bare. And so for me, it really is authoritative, quick decision-making. It doesn't even have to be good, the skill. And the person that I really cite is Emmy Martinez. I don't think, you know, th- this idea that Emi Martinez has a large passing range is actually quite false. What he does do, though, is make quick decision-making about releasing the ball. And so when you're looking at the yeah. impact of build-up, at least from an Arsenal sense when he was here, it wasn't necessarily that he had a large passing range. I mean, sure, he could give you a nice yeah, long ball. But you know what, I'll be honest with you, most keepers can in time and space. What was What was good about it was he recognized the space was on, and he completed it. It's not exactly, for lack, yeah. it's not for lack of skill, right? And so, for me, decision making is absolutely critical to a to a goalkeeper. I mean, no, I make no mistake you know, about it. Where Jan Oblak is my favorite keeper in the world right now, and I confidently say he's the best goalkeeper in the world. And you know what? I wouldn't say that's because of his ball playing ability. And while that's great, and while yes, you know, as the modern game, we're using more keepers. Fundamentally, what makes him such a a good goalkeeper is his authority and presence in the box. Okay. We're looking at a keeper that, you know, just exudes confidence that will go claim every ball, doesn't care about being whacked in the head. That's what I need in a keeper. I need that little bit of unhinged ability to say, I don't care about the situation. I'm going to control the narrative. And for me, I need to see that presence in my keepers. And you know what? To be fair, I don't know if what I'm talking about you can attribute to Leno, <laughs> even in his most. Yeah. Even in his most no, confident, not. yeah, and even in his most confident of pumps, he doesn't strike me as a very confident keeper. So what do I mean by that? When when a goalkeeper parries the ball, I need that parry to go out of bounds, not back into play. I don't see that with Leno. Uh, when I'm when I'm looking at claims in the box, I need somebody that's going to rush firmly early and catch the ball and not want to fall down. With the whole Neil Mope incident, I'm sorry. If I'm a keeper, I'm nailing my knee into your back. I'm not leaning to the side to try to catch the ball. 
and then fall awkwardly. If yeah. I'm a keeper, I'm rushing out and I'm barging you over. That That's what I need in my keeper. And so just some of the basic skills that he does is just aren't authoritative for me. And that's my biggest critique of, you know, Burt Leno. And when I look at a keeper, it's a huge thing about what I do. And so maybe I'll go back in terms of a keeper that, you know, maybe had a rough time in preseason for us, Arthur Oconquo, a reason why I have such high hopes for him, while he may have shown a little bit of flappy hands right now, which is, again, all nerves. What I love is you're looking at a 6'6 keeper who generally, when I look at him, he commands his box with excellent authority in the youth games, and he's not afraid to get kicked. He's not afraid to make those quick decisions. When he does receive the ball, he releases it quickly to his defensive line. And those are the things that when I start to project, right, and I go, okay, if you're in the Champions League final, are you going to shy away from that? You know, um, we can even look at an even better example this past Euro final in Donnarumma, who was an absolutely immense penalty shot stopper. And part of that Correct. wasn't the, um, you know, the Emmy Martinez method of I'm going to talk to you to get in your head. You don't need to do those things. I know we all love it because we love a gossip story, but Donnarumma's presence there, make no mistake about it, it unnerved some world-class players. It and did. for me, that, that authority gene is what I look for in a world-class keeper, right? Perry, Perry's out of bounds. They can't be back into play. Um, sure, having the ball at your feet is great, but I want quick decision-making. So playing the pass that's on really quick is much more important than, say, having an ability to have an Ederson-like passing range. So, yeah, just to end, really, uh, that authoritative gene in the box to control narratives and quick decision-making. Do you think goalkeepers have, you know, they have to be from a certain country to thrive? Because, I I, I don't know, I read it somewhere on Twitter the other day uh, where people said, you know, Goalkeepers have to, be, if they're from, you know, Eastern European countries, I, I trust they trust them more, more than you know, goalkeepers are from, let's say, Germany or Spain. Could it, could it have anything to do with their lifestyle or, or their upbringing? Because it's really weird that we're connected. But for me, it's a very valid point that you know, the best goalkeepers that I've, you know, I've had a liking to, I've been from Eastern European countries. I think that comes with what George said. It's, I think it's, it comes with a stereotypical idea Eastern of European. people being on <laughs> yeah. in Eastern yeah. Europe. And George, was that, George has said that the keepers are generally the craziest person in your team. And they're associated with being yeah. crazy. So that's where that I think that stereotypical phrase comes from where I want my keeper to be Eastern European. And also, mate, they're very like alpha and authoritative in their culture, <laughs> like Eastern yeah. Europeans. Yeah. In terms of, you know, I, I look, Z, I think you have a point, to be honest. Look, I think, um, for example, strikers, it makes no uh, mistake that, you know, South American generally who have grown yes. up quite poor make some of the best strikers. And it's a mentality thing. Like for me, I feel as though Eastern European culture carries this aura of authoritative and respect too. like it's a big part in, that's ingrained in their culture. Right. Like, you know, youth can't talk to adults. You know, you can't disrespect. And, you know, I don't see that difference in many other cultures as much as Eastern European. Really quickly, I have like, a, I used to do judo and I used to have a judo instructor that was from, uh, you know, Yugoslavia and, you know, he was a refugee and he was taking zero kind of, you know, pacha. I would make jokes in practice and he goes, no, jokes are for after practice, not during practice. And it's like, I don't use it just to be that yeah. stereotypical, sure. you know, mentality. But, but again, that mentality works for a keeper, you know, that, I am in charge. This is the rule. This is the highway. And I don't care what's going to happen. Yeah, you might have a point. You know, I think that culture does exude that. And, you know, uh, there's a reason, you know, Jan Oblak, even, you know, your Petr Czechs and you go and down. Anovich, the and the Anovich, yeah. But quickly, you yeah, said exactly. something on Donnarumma. And I wanted to add to that Donnarumma point with him being mentally unfazed because some, if you do listen back on, on the commentary, they're like, Donnarumma hasn't moved until yeah. he gets the ball. And that, for players, 90% of penalty takers, they wait till the keeper moves. Like Jorginho. Well, that's why Pickford saved his pen, because Pickford waited till the end, then moved. And with Donnarumma, his, his mental edge was so good that he saves the last penalty and just walks away like nothing even happened. And he just won the, the second biggest trophy there is to win in the world. Yeah. Because he wasn't even thinking about sure. celebrating. He was just thinking, I need to save the next pen. 
So it was even that that yeah. mental edge is immense to have on your side as a as a team and a goalkeeper. Yeah, really and, quickly, you have to be in the yeah. moment. Sorry, just like the last thing as a keeper, That's I think fun. because it's different from any other position, you don't have to think three, four steps ahead necessarily. In that moment, you have to be 10 out of 10. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think for every other position on the pitch, you do have to be 10 out of 10 in aspects in the moment, but you also have to think you know, three, four steps ahead for each position. And so it's a slightly different mentality change from players versus a goalkeeper. And it kind of goes back to that point, the goalkeeper union, they are really their own breed. They really are. Every team, any kind of basic from Sunday league up to the to the professionals, goalkeepers yeah. have their own, uh, you know, interactions. <laughs> so, they don't have their own coaches. They're, they're just unique. They're, they they're are very unique. Like four of them have, three or four of them have that one coach who yeah. they're with all the time. So they are very different. Now that you know we're still talking about goalkeepers, you know, comparing them to outfield players, you know, one thing we you know we've we've noticed throughout the years is that goalkeepers tend to get better with age. You know, we've seen the best goalkeepers. You know, for example, Van der Sar at the age of forty was winning Premier Leagues for Manchester United. Uh, wh why do you think that that is the case? Why do you think goalkeepers get better with age? Well, mate, really simply because mentality is such a big part of their job. Like if in terms of what we're saying about being authoritative in the box, that comes with age, like that comes with experience and, and recognizing to be authoritative kind of in the moment and not lose your head. All those qualities get ripened with age and get, you know, kind of just in terms of basic maturity, you know. Um, your, your brain, by the way, just don't want to be too nerdy and sciencey, is still developing up to the age of 23. Your prefrontal cortex about simple decision making isn't developed until it's 23. That's rooted in, in, in very basic science. So for me, that's why I also use that 23 as like a little bit of an age mark myself, <laughs> even, you know. Um, but that's why in keepers it's so important and why you see kind of keepers extend more than in any other kind of group and of course there's an athletic component right like let, let's be real like i mean you do have to be agile but it's there isn't like that athletic demand on a keeper so they do have longer careers no. and that. they do tend to stay longer in the bigger teams like buffon has been in uv and psg till 38 40 so in a bigger team he's, he's going to see the ball less anyway so he can't stay there for longer like van der Sar was also in united till like 40. So yeah. they do see less of the ball, so, and their presence alone can keep them in that goal for a very long time. Yeah, but I remember seeing Van der Sar making some amazing saves. So I don't know. That's what I was thinking. Do they lose their? Do, do they lose their athletic ability? They got you know reached the age of thirty-five. 30, I think they lose or, or is it they just more of age? But that's yeah, just yeah. more of age. But that presence is what keeps them there for long, I think. Okay, um, let's move on to centre halves. I mean, it's it's pretty similar to the goalkeeper um, debate as well. I mean, because goalkeepers also, you know, apparently they tend to get better with age. I mean, what are the best things that you would, you know, you would look in, um, look at us and um, looking for in, in a centre half? But the top five qualities, let's say, that that would be the most important. Let's start with you, George. Yeah, so um, for me, controlled aggression is the single most important thing for a defender. So when you're left in isolation, what do I mean by controlled aggression? It's essentially your ability to quickly meet your marker and then to slow down and then guide them line and don't create a foul. That is the best way of defending, okay? And in order to do that, it takes a lot of, you know, mental strength to meet your marker quick, but then slow down. It's very counterintuitive. Something I work on with kids for like really, really young. And, you know, it's a very hard skill to master. Um, but for me, controlled aggression, especially in today's game, which, by the way, favors attackers 100 percent as a former defender. You know, it used to bug the hell out of me. But, you know, we are very lenient to an attacker because we want to see goals. And so... This idea of a foul has really evolved in modern games to really benefit the attackers. And so controlled aggression becomes more and more important. 
um, where you have to make sure not to raise your hands in a challenge and you've got to make sure that you're controlling your body, but also you want to stop the player. It's very, very difficult. And so for me, that controlled aggression is probably one of the top traits. And another trait that I really look for, again, similar to goalkeepers, they need to be authoritative in the challenge. And so what do I mean by that? Yeah. Both aerially and on the ground in duels, you need to make sure that you're there first. And any hesitation is something that I really detest. And I really detest this in Rob Holding. I'll use as a classic example <laughs> with somebody yeah. that, you know, when, you, when, you, when he faces a marker, you can immediately see him go, but then back off. And mm -hmm. that's not authority in the challenge mm -hmm. for me. And no. it, it doesn't matter if you're athletically deficient or not. Go and meet your marker and control that space. That's your first job as a defender, regardless of you being athletically deficient or not. You need to, you need to be there. And you know what? I use Ben White as maybe an alternative example who isn't – he's quick, but he's not like Varane quick. He's not, you know, these massive pace mergents. But what he does brilliantly is he gets to the marker, and as a stopper, he's authoritative in his duels. So mm – -hmm. That, that could be an example of like two similar athletic deficiencies, but how they deal with it is very different. Um, you know, other things is, of course, positioning and awareness. I think a lot of times that you find defenders sometimes worrying about blindside runs without forgetting their space originally. And so somebody that can get caught blindside or follow a dummy run is something I worry on as a defender. You need to control your space and your zone first. And you need to have a certain amount of trust in your line to deal with it together. And so this is a little bit different from midfielders and attackers and dealing with the counter press. That awareness and positioning becomes very vital as a center back in making sure to control space. And you know what? Virgil van Dijk and even Khalidou Koulibaly does do this excellently in terms of how they're able to control space. There's a famous clip, you know, van Dijk when he's on a two-on-one. And he's able to stop that, you know, in the Premier League by control. And what he did there, you know, yeah. again, he cut off the passing lane, but he didn't bite. And what I mean by that, oh. he didn't go to one side. And he was just controlling the space. And when the pass was on, that's when he became aggressive. That's yeah, like, important them as well. Yes. And, but he, if, if you guys really slow that down, and I hate to be a weird tactico, he had huge controlled aggression. There. <laughs> he was calm blocking the space and once the pass was over in terms of just a yard he became very aggressive and mm. ran and closed it off and he turned a two-on-one which is very easy to score on into really a one-on-one -on -one and a one-on-one -on -one. yeah. because he that he just did that brilliantly and so again i think those those are the big three traits for me i'll, I'll leave the next two as like future traits that i think are going to be massive in the game and that is um your receiving of the ball as a center back, um, oh. the, this idea of build up right now, it's not so much um, ball playing ability, but it's your gait and how you receive and positioning. It, this can yeah. be extended, by the way, to midfielders, but I really highlight this in center backs because they don't have time. They're going to be counter pressed in the future like this. So, how a center back receives the ball and opens his body to the play, it has to be in one fluid motion. If I see a center back yeah. do this very chop and change, then I worry. And so for me, they got to be able to open their body up quite well. And I think just finally, when we're looking at buildup, a ball carrying ability is going to be huge. And you know what? I'm going to cite my boy, uh, Saliba. Yeah. Th this quality, okay, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to worry many uh, people who are stuck in the past. But this idea to have a dribbler in the back line is going to be of the That's utmost wild. importance. Yeah, it, it's going to be of the utmost importance in a counter press moving forward. And so the ability to become a ball carrying progressor is huge. And by the way, Ben White has this in abundance. Yeah. Like if you're does, looking yeah. at um, why I'm so excited about Ben White, all those traits that I've just highlighted, forget the play and the profile of the player, right? Those broad traits, he excels in. And so for me, um, in every single one, by the way, he, he's not the greatest in the air, but positioning and awareness, he's immense. There's really not much better. And so you can make up for physical limitations by having these five traits in my mind. So, yeah, um, yeah just, to, just to review, it's ball carrying progressor. It's awareness and gait. 
as well. You can kind of combine the two, but um, you know, build up, you want to make sure that you're receiving properly. Awareness positioning, um, you also want to make sure that you're authoritative, both in your ground and your aerial duels. Um, and you combine those traits and mate, you're, you're set. That's probably yours. That's what I look for personally in traits of a center back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go. Um, for me, yeah, go what value is four, but you, you asked for five, so I'd say like um, strength in duels, <laughs> aerially and on the ground is, is important yeah. because defenders generally do have to inter or engage in many duels, especially aerially, depending on when you play lower teams because they generally go for a target man. So even if you're not the, the best aerially, at least be there to contest because that will always con like make decisions change. Um, another thing is positioning and spatial awareness because no matter how old you get, which is why I think, which is another, which is one of the main things I think keeps defenders in the game longer than attackers and, and midfielders is that if you do possess that reading of the game and spatial awareness, even you see it in the best of the best, like Pepe till 38 now, we can still match Ronaldo and stuff like this because spatial awareness yeah. is very important in the sense that on the ball and off the ball, be aware of your surroundings because someone aware of their surroundings look like they have more time than they actually do which will always be beneficial to the team. Another thing I'd, I'd like to highlight is bravery in the sense that the defender, generally defenders are the leader or the goalkeeper or the defender will be the captain of the team. And the captain has to communicate and lead and lead by example. So being brave is, is, an, is an exemplary attribute to have because you need to to show some risk, as I've said, you need your players to be able to risk it for your, the team, which will always provide confidence for others. Because you see a defender make a brave last ditch tackle, and everybody gets hyped, which will always be beneficial. So for me, that like, bravery, spatial awareness, positioning, reading of the game, and strength in duels, and on the ball ability now is becoming much more important because you see the defenders much more involved in build-up. Yeah, so that's my five, to be honest. Moving over from defenders, so I think we've touched on more on centre-halves, centre-backs, but there's another <laughs> other side to it, which is right-backs, left-backs, your full-backs, essentially. Those qualities that you've, you know, you've explained to me, what what else would you look in, looking for a full-back? I mean, obviously, you know, they have to be good at defending because, you know, there are the main yeah. defenders, but... There's, there's, now with that football had, has advanced a lot, I mean, we need proper attacking qualities too. But what are the main things for, for those as well? I mean, let's touch on it. Yeah, I mean, look, fullbacks really, like they, right now, I'm confident in saying the fullback is the most athletically demanding position on the pitch. There isn't, there isn't a more yeah. uh, athletically demanding pos position that you can have. And so for me, it might be a moot point, but it is really physical stamina and repeat sprint ability is absolutely massive for me. Like, do they have the ability to, you know, show repeat sprint ability, not just short, but long, a big thing for me. And I use in the premier league, you know, it's one of my bingo buzzwords, elite five yard pace that for a fullback is huge. Like it's absolutely massive because it's good, not just in an attacking sense, but more so in a defending stance. So when I say to meet our marker and if you're nippy, to meet your marker. You need to have really great elite five yard pace to meet your marker out wide because if you give them time yeah. and space, they'll burn you because you are very alone out wide, at least in the center with a center back partner. You typically have enough central compactness to deal with any deficiencies, but out wide, that's where the space is for the attacker, not for you as the defender. And so you need to really have repeat sprint ability, both over five yards, but also 15. And that kind of goes both ways, you know, attack attack and defense. Um, I think as a fullback now, there's going to be a lot more demand on your IQ and awareness uh, in the final third um, because they're actually asked to be experts in both boxes, aren't they? You know, um, you're going to look at it. And it, it isn't fair, I'll be honest, as, as a former fullback. It isn't fair because you're asked. They're different brains. They really are. In terms of when you do look at it like, you know, a, a midfielder and we'll get there, 
a lot of their skills are generalizable to kind of the center of the pitch and to options. They're very rarely okay. placed in situations where they're isolated. Whereas a fullback, if you really think about it, that's all they're ever asked to do, isn't it? Whether it's an attacking or a defensive sense. You isolate one on one. Yeah. You have to you have to be key isolated one v one. And so yeah, if I had to like really calm it down into like those three traits, I would say elite over five and fifteen yards. But you got to be nippy to your marker. I really need you to get out quick from your space and you know defend that area well. Controlled aggression is like a shared trait of all defenders. You know, you really should be having that. So that becomes an important trait. And then finally, like I said, one v one ability both ways. It becomes such a key moment where oh, yeah, of course. you you got to understand in both boxes awareness. So that yeah, that would well, be maybe, it for me. One thing that def all defenders share is the spatial awareness and positioning, which a defender, a, a fullback is different because you need that spatial awareness and positioning on both sides of the ball, so offensively and defensively. And I think one of the best at that right now is probably Hakimi because you see with Hakimi, his tackling is not, his defending wasn't as good, but he has the spatial awareness and positioning to, to make up for his his weakness in defensive attributes. And another thing I'd contribute, which I'd agree with George, is the they probably are the most physically demanding position on the on the pitch right now, especially in terms of intensity and stamina, which is why I think James Milner was able to play fullback because he's but he has by far the best stamina on that Liverpool team. And you see in their, in their training videos with him doing the bleep test and being everybody. And we just see recently Hakimi do the same thing in PSG where he beats everybody in the bleep test and he just lies flat on the floor. So their their fitness is, is different to the other players in the team. So fitness yeah. and, and stamina and endurance is definitely a big thing for fullbacks. And I think crossing and, sh and shooting has become... Or crossing and passing in, in particular has become important or always been important for fullbacks because now generally a lot of them are act as wingers when they're on the ball we see that yeah. a lot with Tierney he's our left winger or when Omari Hutchison just played he was our left winger so the fullback acts as a winger and defender in one so it is definitely the most demanding position and the most varied position or one of the most varied positions because a, uh, fullback can be asked to be inverted as a centre mid or yeah. open up as a left wing. I was just going to say, Chris, like if you really think about it, the fullback is asked to do every position on the pitch in the modern day. It is He is asked, like when yeah, you're, is, when you're yeah. looking at it, I want you to be a fullback, make sure you're good in defence, but also you need to be a great winger also and you need to make sure that you're providing sure. width. But at the same time, in case we want to switch formations, can you be a right centre midfielder or an inverted you know, it's kind crazy. of midfielder? It, it, it's very yeah. crazy when you think about it. So for me, though, it, just because there are really so many demands on it, most of this are athletic in demands for me when I look at it. Because for me, I think everybody's really grown up in a lot more appreciation for the ball. I think we can say that across every position where, you know, sure. ability on the ball is just taking the next level in the sport. But for fullbacks, I think really just quickly, having that speed over five yards and over 15 yards is absolutely immense right now. You need to have those. You need to be quick to your markers, but that also applies in an offensive end, right? So if you are, you know, maybe kind of on the pitch isolated because you're going to be in a lot more one-on-ones, having that elite five-yard ability and that elite decision-making in five yards is really the crux of a, becoming a meme from a Max Aaron standpoint of losing your marker blind side, or more of a meme of an Aaron Wan Basaka further up the pitch, not being able to create that separation, right? Yeah. So I think that's the key uh, thing that I at least look for. And what exudes in my favorite target, Rydal Baku, he excels in yeah. every single one of those things. In yeah. fact, he's the poster yeah. child for sprints and elite five yard and 15 yard bursts. So it makes no mistake for me of course he's got great awareness you know he's yeah. a freak uh, you know an iq but i think that's really the big thing about fullbacks that we're looking at right like you look at quickly, on fullback, quickly on a fullback with, 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 yeah, i was gonna go on one bisaka because one bisaka is generally seen as the, yeah. the best defensive fullback in the world but he with sure. one <laughs> with one bisaka is like one v one defending 
he's conquered all wingers like Neymar, Mbappe, uh, Obama Yang. 1v1, he's done all of them. But that's where the awareness and positioning comes in. Because if you see many goals he concedes, it's because his blind side awareness isn't always it. Which means he's, he's forgetting about the runs over his shoulder or behind him. Which he may be the best one-on-one -on -one defender in the world. But that awareness that he lacks will always cost him. It will. Because he is a fullback. It will. I think, and it goes to show because I think with the fullback position, I think they're probably the most versatile players on the pitch. They, like George has been touched up on, they can play. <laughs> they play central midfield. They play the wing. They play even. They even, you know, try to defend. And it's 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 to do with the education. You know, when most of the time we see fullbacks, they're usually failed wingers or failed midfielders. Mm -hmm. But most like, but most of the time, I think the best fullbacks are the ones that are failed midfielders because they have, you know. They have the, posi the positional awareness, you know, of being in central midfield, and also, you know, whilst they, they need to track back, you know, they need to cover on the right, right or the left. So I think that's where you know football's um, football has evolved. You know, and now we're seeing players like Raido Baku. He's, you know, he, he was yeah, right wing, right wing central midfield. We've seen Tavares, you know, who we saw yesterday. He he played central midfield um, in one of the videos that I was I'm watching, him, and I was like, yeah, and I was like, wow, okay, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that he, he's you know very versatile. James Justin for um, Leicester, he used to play um, midfield as well. So again, that's that that shows how versatile that position is, and we can't just name them as like probably the the worst, like the the least talented. I think they are the most talented. We need fullbacks. They're the most, Football, maybe most unique. They're the, the most unique, and I think I, I feel like George. George has, you know, pretty much said, you know, our uh, for the for Arsenal's transfer plans, it pretty much leans on the right back position, and he's right because that is so important to how we play. What central midfielder, you know, that the team gets? Do we get a box to box sorry, playing play playmaker? You know, it all lies on that right back that we get. So, hundred hundred and ten percent, you know, I agree with that. Um, I think let's 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 move on to the central the midfield position. You know, there's there's obviously you know different um, types of midfielders. There's a six, there's the eight, and there's the a tens. I, I want to touch on all three. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it because we'll be we'll be here all day. But let's go. Let's start with CK. Um, we'll, we'll give you the um, the time to speak about a six. What do you look for in a six? Okay, so quickly on the midfielder. Generally, a lot of people say central midfield is the the hardest place to play in football, and I think that's because mm. it's definitely the most crowded area generally on the pitch, which makes it harder for a player to succeed because all them players are elite with massive amounts of space, but with less space is where you find who's the the special ones. So, like for me, in a in a central midfielder, I th I think. Again, positioning and spatial awareness is key, and maybe more so in a midfielder because you have less space that you have to be aware of. So those that look like they have all the time in the world, with like the Lampards, the Perlos, the Gerards, them, they're so special because they they're so aware of everything around them, and maybe three, four, five steps ahead of everybody else. That that's what separates them from everybody. I think. Ball control and being able to receive the ball is important because having the ball under control quicker gives you more time in a place where there's less space and time. So that ball control and ability to receive and get rid of the ball quickly will always be beneficial. I think stamina is another thing because a lot of midfielders and fullbacks are the ones that cover the most ground. All, all around on the pitch. So stamina is definitely, and for a six in particular, I think controlled aggression is a big thing because they're the they're the, probably the last one before the defense and they're the protector. So they're the ones, so being able to, to make a tackle and it not be a foul like nine times out of 10 is, all, is a massive trait for a midfielder to be counted onto to be a, a six or a partner or a lone six because lone six is one of the hardest positions to play in football because it's, you have a lot more responsibility so being able to make tackles and be aggressive without causing a foul costing the team 
is so beneficial, which gives you gives you more responsibility, and therefore you be more trustworthy. So, my five traits are the spatial awareness, the controlled aggression, the ball control, the stamina, and like the strength in in those. Come on, give me an example. Give me an example of your perfect six. Right now, yeah. Ruba Curry Simari. Come on, man. <laughs> that con this controlled aggression at 21 years of age is immense. Like, his controlled aggression is passing, he's dribbling, like, <laughs> he's defending. Like, he is incredible. Like, I, I've probably, I was, I was even accepting that he was done to Leicester till, like, the day they announced it. Like, he's that good. <laughs> so, like, for me, Ruba Curry Simari is probably the best six I'd wish for. In football right now, the dream never ends, mate. You know, you never know he could be at ours in a few years. Yeah, you never know. The pinnacle, they're, they're never above them. Don't give up, man. <laughs> um, George, let's talk about eights. What, yeah, go on. Um, so eight, eights are unique because eights change in roles depending on their formations quite a bit. And so, what I mean by that is, you know. And look, if you're one of those four three three advocates, an eight can be multiple things. You know, either you get your all rounder eights, who generally, what the name implies, all round great in multiple traits. And I think the best example for me right now is Nico Barella, um, also Maxon's Kakaret from Leon in that same mold. Players that are you know excellent a on the half turn that can attack space, burst into space, but are also great in the duels and are great with controlled aggression and controlling really the tempo of the game, maybe the uh, model inspiration mentor is uh, Modric in that sense, you know, um, that that's maybe your all round eight, but then sometimes you've got your specialty eights, right? So you look at more, you're running eights. So maybe somebody like a Joe Willock or an Aaron Ramsey, your late arrivals into the box, somebody that specializes in, you know, their movement off the ball being, you know, immense and, and a trait on its own in terms of arrival and understanding where to be. Um, and then, and then, of course, you know, you've got your pure attacking eights that, you know, on the ball are just absolute wizards, right? And, you know, you, you can kind of look back at your Kevin De Bruyne in this aspect where you look at final ball crossing yeah. and stuff like that. But an eight for me, there's a couple things that you really need to do. Um, number one is scanning. It absolutely is the most important trait in any midfielder. That's a six or a ten or anything, by the way. It's the key trait. If anybody can take away from this video, what do I look for in any midfielder? How many times do they scan? And what is that? It's simply looking behind you, getting a picture for the pitch. And, you know, the amount of times that somebody does that in a short space interval is very key about how well they're going to progress in the sport for a midfielder for me. Um, look, you've got to have great ball control and gait for me. Um, it's half turn ability, but it's also riding the challenge. And somebody I love is actually Bukayo Saka. He's got one of the best traits of that in the world in terms of just absolute ability to uh, create space where there is none on the half turn. We saw that at the Euro Cup to excellent degree. You know, he's very good at letting the ball come to him with space and then turning people, but not even controlling it. Yeah, and it's just it's just immense, but that's a very key elite trait in the midfield, ironically, that, you know, is transferable to anywhere on the pitch. And when you're looking at a space that doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver, that half turn ability is the absolute key. So really scanning, half turn ability, and then attacking um, you know, the the pass that's on, I call it. So I get really annoyed when my players vacate their zones. Cough cough, Danny Ceballos. <laughs> um and what I mean by that is it's not just, you know, receiving the ball and attacking, but outside your zone, if you leave your area of the pitch to go and follow a defender, it's far more yeah. detrimental in the center mid than it is on other positions in terms of attacking and whatnot. Yeah, so you have to have space where there's no space. Exactly. And so it, it's about maintaining your compactness and your short distances because you have to remember, I, I do this to my kids. I actually tie a string to all of my kids in center mid and I'll throw the ball to one area of the pitch and they'll all run together to it. And I'll say, look, your string is loose. I need that to be taught. And so what I mean by that is I need to have the first player attack the space, but your second player has to supplement him. I can't have my third player attracted to the ball as well. If that happens, you lose your straight 
the string becomes loose and they're like, okay, no, I get it now um, in terms of where they need to go. And so that regimented positioning though, that's really key as an eight very specifically because they're responsible for connecting a lot of the system. And so they need to make sure that they're never vacating their zone. Um, so yeah, maybe not quite five traits, but I think those very specific ones, scanning, half turn ability, but mainly riding the challenge. Are they able to take contact and play and turn it into a positive? That's very key. And then finally, maintaining your zone and positioning, making sure not yeah. to vacate your zone. Come on, give me a name as well. <laughs> Who's your perfect eight? Who's my perfect eight? Um, hmm. yeah. All three types you said, all the three types you said. Yeah, so I think um, Nico Barella right now is probably the closest to that all-rounder eight that you know I absolutely love. Um, and it's tough for me because I'm not a huge fan of just the all-rounder eights, but I'd say he is a great example. And then lastly, he's with us, Thomas Partey. I absolutely love the, love the guy. That That's an example for me of a perfect eight type profile. For me, I love Vieira. I, maybe if I can go deeper. He was your prototypical eight in a midfield that did absolutely everything even a, maybe a little another shout out abu diaby i know i'm giving a lot of names but these are the type of players that i really value um as eights yeah um now that we're, now that you know we're coming towards the end of that midfield it's the dying breed it's the number 10 position Right, we don't talk about tens like that anymore. So <laughs> I, I don't even know if I want to speak about it. But no, we have to. Um, do we? Do we even think about tens like that anymore? I mean, everywhere I see now, it's more. It's become like um, George calls it. It's just this the Suedo ten position, the left wing, the left winger slash number ten. You know, what is it? What is it about that position has, that has changed? I mean, I, I I don't understand. I mean, I, when I was looking at players like um, Madison and um, and then compare it to Bruno Fernandes, people are saying, you know, it's hard to fit, fit these players in, in in the current teams of, you know, in big clubs. That's why they, you know, they play for, you know, um, a Manchester United who are not doing the best in terms of, you know, winning trophies and they would play for Leicester who play like in a 4-2-3-1. What is it about that 10 position that's dying? Well, mate, simply we vacate it. Like before, that used to be the zone that we did the most work. So, you know, you're you, look, I hate to get into a Mesut Ozil debate, but there's no debate that he was amongst the most generational tens of the game, period. Yeah, of course. And exactly. like, I, I, I think it gets conflated with what somebody did at the end of their career, but make no mistake, he was a generational 10. And I think it's because of how modern football has switched to more transition focus in terms of how we um, actually attack, right? Like we we look to de to transition from defense to attack as quickly as possible. And that means vacating the central spaces quite a lot. All the best teams in the yeah. world, the attack down the sides and, you know, look at conversions through cutbacks, right? Like that, I know Mikel got a lot of stick for saying that last year, but that's the fact about some of the, you know, best teams, you know, in the world right now. That's what we're doing. So we're vacating that zone 14, that you know everyone likes or the top of the D where you know your traditional number 10 would really operate we're vacating that zone and we're attacking through the sides right and we're using that central zone to pull out your center backs that's what we're actually doing it's not used to orchestrate an attack it's used to um kind of mm -hmm. find decoys in it i think that's the reason you see kind of a loss of the 10 breed so to speak but you know you're going to look at a 10 now making sure that he applies those characteristics but in different areas of the pitch so really when you look at yeah. emil smith rowe who's now your prototype new modern midfielder when i call him a pseudo 10 kind of in it, he's going to apply <laughs> the same principles kind of at the top of yeah, the he D, but he does it both sides and he's never actually in the d if <laughs> that makes sense yeah he's not um, and so you're going to actually find a lot of these. So for me, if I look at a 10 in quotations, he's going to be somebody that's able to apply those principles on both sides of the pitch, not necessarily just in the center, because a lot of those um, ideas about awareness, through ball, seeing the play, they're all doing that right now. It's just the idea is many people vacate that zone because I think they've recognized, why should I attack center backs when I can attack fullbacks? 
that's a, another thing that I don't think people Relax. have yeah. looked at really. So it's not just that we're going more transition game in general. It's just if you look now, the center backs, they're massive. They're huge and they're athletic demons. You know, they're great 1v1. It's not like days of old where they're just lumps <laughs> that are there. You know, you get this weird concoction of six foot four athletic freaks that can run with you and you're like, no, I don't want any of that. I'm good. I'll go to the wings where, you know, I can overpower a nippy fullback. That probably makes more sense. And so, yeah, for me, I think it's because we vacate that zone, really. And as coaches, we look to the sides as the point of weakness, not the center, because I think coaches have become so good now, they leave no space in the center. And so that results in having space yeah. outside. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 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 CK, I, I wanted to ask you actually, just um, on, just on the basis of the attacking midfielder position, the number ten. What what is it that you know you look for in that that, that number ten? Is it chance creation or is it the goal scoring potential? I think. What, what is it for you that you know that ticks a box? I think I'd like them to do both, to be honest, because having yeah. because you need a source of goals all over the team so them being able to to create goals either through themselves or through for other people's for other people is is very beneficial i think the wide overload aspect primarily of emil smith Rowe is a big 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 aspect because it creates numerical advantages for your team and you you'll find yourself 3v2 out wide or 2v1 out wide which will always make it beneficial for yourselves, which is another way that most big teams now are looking to create their goals because the partnerships are becoming, but well, they were important in the 4 4 twos, but with the 4 3 threes and the 4 2 3 ones, the, the partnerships that have been created, like the 10 is generally involved in, in the partnerships more. So you see Smith Rowe with Saka and Bellerin or Smith Rowe with, with Tierney and Whoever's playing on the left, Pepe, for example, like they 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 create more as a team of of three people. They create more, and you see more of these like diamonds and triangles. So, I think they attack out wide because of any structure. It be in football, in no, in in normal society, the the center of the structure will always be the strongest part. So they attack the width because it is the weakest part of the structure. So them them. Tense, as you say, don't look to, to play that cute final ball anymore. Like Odegaard or Ozil, they, they're more, I'm not sure what it is, but they're more like athletic and physical and more goal scorers like Madison and Bruno. Who yeah. I don't think much of a 10, but like Madison, Bruno. Yeah, them stuff. And the oldest ones of them is like Muller or something. Who's not yeah, like, yeah. Him. he's different. He's more like, the goal scoring 10, but he's so smart that he's lost his physicality, but he's still playing in the top teams. And by yeah, the no. way, really no. quickly, like those types of 10s, which I associate more with the Buendia, are used best on the wing now for a good reason because they they don't have that physicality in the center to compete both ways. So p teams accommodate that type of profile by giving them a more free yeah. role on the Bernardo, wing. Yeah, like when you look at it, that type of player that maybe doesn't have that is best on the wing for that reason. They're not necessarily only on the wing, but you can't have them in the center because of the demands that they have to do off the ball. And I think even Ozo, if we did have him, he really stayed on the wings. Like even towards the end of his career, it was very rare that he was in the center anymore. And I think it's because of that space that we look at and what we... Even all the guard that Real Sociedad that when he had that, that team of the season, yeah. Played right, maybe more on the right. So yeah, I agree with the fact that they're part of wine more. Defensive actually, qualities. Do you defensive qualities? Do you think it's quite important for them as well, or do you need them to press to you know track back, or it's something that you don't really look for anymore? I mean, we 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 obviously you know liken that to Mr. Ozil. He got a lot of stick because he didn't look like the pr player to press or track back we did see a lot of running from him but not the not with the assertiveness you know that we would like what do you think 
it's about intensity, Z. It's like for me, he actually had the most absolute kilometers, and I don't. I always push back that he ran almost the most out of anybody on the team. Yeah, he did. He did the numbers, he was the highest. He was always the highest, but it wasn't. That's not really? the case for me now. Like the issue is, you can no longer. He used to run for himself, though. This is what I will say. Like a lot of his running was run. opening space, which it, it was needed. Okay, I'm not critiquing it. It's needed to do that. Yeah, but. He didn't have the intensity both ways. And this is what I really struggle with. When I see a player that is very intense in his attacking sense, but then won't do it in the first 15 yards the other way, yeah. it becomes very questionable. For him. Look, as a coach, do you know what I do for attack? Because they don't want to do it. Convincing a number 10, a winger, or a striker to even do it. Do you know how hard it is as a coach to tell them, yeah, buddy, I need you to track back when I know all you care about is scoring goals or assisting. And what I tell them and I'm sure it's come out in other interviews, is as a coach, I say, look, you give me your best over the first five yards, it's way less running than you giving your best 15 yards the other yeah. way. So you give me your first five seconds of your press and we win the ball back, you can start doing what you love to do quicker and more often. But if you're there and you're lazy and you're going to sit back and run large amounts of yards, it's going to be more work for you. And so I... But that mentality is very tough to coach out, Z. And so for those Mesut Ozil types, even those Buendias, I don't see that intensity the other way in larger distances. And it worries me because you can't have that in the center anymore. You get burned. You get creamed. We've seen it, we've seen it in the Euro Cup now. We've seen it in, you know, even in the uh, Champions League final. Having a team that doesn't have central compactness right now you lose and you lose that basketball type transition battle yeah. that Emery became, you know, known for. If you lose that central compactness, you're going to get creamed in this new transition game. So for me, it's not so much running mate. It's the intensity of the first five yards both ways. Yeah, I think Wenger said it. Like, Wenger said it. I think it was Wenger, but because you've been talking, talking about Ozil, is that Alexis was loaded for Mm. Look at all this pressing and stuff he does. But Wenga said he did a lot of walking. It's just once he lost the ball, that first five, 15 yards, he was off sprinting, sprinting. Then he just walked. And they always tell them attackers that wouldn't you rather you do all that sprinting and it causes your you to win the ball 15, 20 yards higher than to you walk and your whole defence have to, to defend and get back into your structure. And that's why I think a lot more attackers will are more inclined to, to do that five fifteen yard press or the counter press is why a lot of them doing now more is because if I win the ball off the defender on the edge of the box I'm much closer to the goal than if my midfielder or my defenders win it. It's just much more quicker and it cuts out the the, the transition. And if the 10 is not allowing for you to to continuously win the ball back 15 five yards up they're gonna be moved out like Ozil was. Yeah, um, I think we're gonna now speak about the attackers. Now it's that's we've we've left the best for the last, really. <laughs> Wingers and strikers. You know, let's start with you, George, because I know you have a lot to say about your attackers, especially wingers. Um, you know, hit me. Tell me what what you what do you look for in, in your type of wingers, and you know what is the what are the things that you'll be scouting them with. You know, those. Those eight matches that you watch, you know, what what are you gonna be looking at, especially for those wingers? Yeah, really quickly, it's the the best trait is creating separation from a standstill. So when the ball is stopped and the tempo is stopped, how often can they create separation from their marker and burst past? That that becomes probably the crucial portion of any winger. All the elite wingers have it. Also, they have to be able to go in and out on both sides. What do I mean by that? They're out when they're on the outside into attacking the box run and then vice versa. Yeah. If they're on the inside to then be able to go touch line is very important that they're flexible both ways. That's very key. Um, a new thing that's coming now is probably awareness in the box. And so what I mean by that, with more fullbacks joining the attack, you need to be quite aware in a number 10 aspect here of being able to link play and provide an option on the width. And that's becoming more of your pseudo 10 that, you know, I love claim kind of here on Twitter, where your wingers now, they're not only having to have those elite winger traits that I mentioned before, your in and outs, your separations, 
but they're having to have an appreciation for linking play that isn't the case much much often and that's because again we see creativity on the wings now and we don't see it so much in the center of the pitch so they're having to have that blindside awareness about having almost those wing tip on the mirrors knowing where their marker is having that perspective and you know look Bukayo does that excellently right like both running on and off the ball he's excellent in blindside yeah. runs he showed it at the Euros but what really makes that kid special yeah. is that IQ in understanding where he needs to be in the final third. It's absolutely immense. And so now I'm actually looking at IQ as a huge winger trait. I really am because the demand on it is actually kind of like a 10. It's no longer just, it oh, is. you're 1v1, beat your marker and whip in a cross. It no longer is no. that. It's, okay, beat your marker. I want you to get involved in play and I need you to make the off the ball run so that your striker has more space in the box. And so it's it's asking a little bit more of your traditional number 10 aspect on the wing. And so I'd say those um, kind of three major things of effect, creating effective um, separation from a standstill, being able to go in and out on both sides, both right and left wing, but lastly, being able to have link play in terms of understanding where your fullback is. And I think um, maybe just finally, um, we, I call it La Pausa in terms of it's really famously coined on Twitter. And yeah, what, what is it? What What is it? It's just understanding when to attack space. That's really what it is. And that could be with the ball or outside the ball. And what, what it may mean is sometimes slowing down the tempo of the game and then speeding it up at your own pace. But having that tempo control, when to attack space and when to dribble in and out of a certain situation is very key. So you you know what, maybe the famous example of why and who's learned this is Martinelli. So uh, what somebody that, you know, everyone associates as a live wire that used to just run at will for everybody. And that's not necessarily what the game state needs. It may need you to slow things down and wait till things are out of position for you then to attack. And I think he's gotten way better at that. You know, I think that decision making when to attack space intensely is what Mikel is actually amazing at. And that's why he produces such great wingers. Like that understanding of attacking space is absolutely massive. You look at Leroy Sané, even Sterling, who back at Liverpool used to be just this live wire in terms of connecting play. But when he took that next step in terms of his output efficiency, that's when he learned, okay, I need to slow things down at a certain instant and know when to attack the space, when the space is on that's when I'll run intensely and conserve your energy in a sense. And so, yeah, I think those are the big things from a winger. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Um, wingers are generally the, the, the biggest attraction for the team. So you see a lot of them are like crazy dribblers and want to make the defender look stupid. But yeah. I think the most effective ones are the ones probably with the, may care less about their own than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Because the off the ball intelligence is key for a winger or for someone who can play on the wing because I think that movement off the ball which provide space for that centre mid, the right back and the striker all in the at the same time is is special for a team because if someone values me me moving out of a, a spot for myself improving everybody else if someone can can degrade themselves to the level where they allow other people to improve for them to move out of position will always be a massive attribute that would be useful to the team i think obviously pace is a big thing you look for a lot of people of look course for in winger because the explosiveness of certain wingers like martinelli um pedro neto all these guys are extremely explosive and that ex explosiveness is what can kill defenders because getting caught flat footed by someone that explosive you have no chance to catch up generally um dribbling close control is important being able to to get past your man or being able to keep the ball in tight spaces because uh -huh. sometimes you can get caught 2v1 by the defender and the midfielder or defender and center back so being able to get out of tight spaces i think is important for a winger and i think decision making is important to know when to cross and pass or to know when to shoot 
or to know when to dribble, which is what I think Pepe has struggled with because I think although he's a massive excitement to watch, a quality dribbler, he can pop a 30-yard shot from out of nowhere and score, I think he doesn't have the, the decision-making to know when, when do I shoot or when do I pass, which is something that I think he needs to learn. And I just think the basics of ball retention are important, especially when you're a top team and you play a lot of low blocks. So having someone who can recycle the ball and keep the ball and doesn't always like force it and lose the ball for you is incredibly important when you're going to have to sustain attacks constantly against a, a structure like a 4-4-2, for example. So mm-hmm. what I'd say is they're the most exciting play- players on the pitch, but I think knowing when to to, to degrade your... I think degrade is the wrong word, but degrade yourself at the betterment of the rest of the team is important. Yeah. Pace and explosiveness is important. I think dribbling and close control and tight space is important. And decision-making, knowing when to pass, cross, dribble, or shoot at the right time will always be key for a winger. Like Saka has mastered that, in my opinion. Do you think have... the game is... Do you think the game is moving away from um, wingers like Adama Traore, but per se? I mean, he's the best example I could give you because... For me, in terms of output, he's nil. Like he, he does nothing, but he has a massive effect on the game. But one thing I realized in the Euros when he was playing for when he wasn't when he was there for Spain is that he wasn't even being picked to to even come on until you know extra time when like you know defenders were tired and you know he could come on and have an effect of the game. I'm like, are we completely moving away from these kind of wingers? I'm go, we're going for more um, intelligent kind of wingers like you know Chiesa. Um, Pedro, Pedro Neto, we could even say um, Saka. What do you guys think? Not necessarily. Okay, he Triore is a weird example because he's limited. I think Chiesa, yeah, yeah. which is actually kind of odd that you mentioned, because he's very similar, except he's great in tight spaces. And so that's the reason somebody like him has actually picked. I think what we are moving yeah. away from is this larger transition game where the most dominant teams are going to be camped in the opposition half. And so that space just isn't there. What works for Triore is because he works in a 3-5-2, he works on a transition game in Wolves that, you know, they look to leap him free on the opposite side and just let him run. That isn't really associated with many of the top teams anymore because we're looking at dominating possession, being camped in the opponent's half, and that space isn't there to operate. And so if you only have that and you lack technique and tight spaces you end up kind of being redundant and that's what we're seeing with Traore and why Chiesa who is actually quite similar to him but thrives is though very fundamentally in tight spaces and so he can operate in those tight he doesn't need big spaces to thrive he's just as happy in small ones Mm -hmm. what about you Chris do you do do you agree with my statement I mean the reason why I mentioned Chiesa was for me I like him to him I I think I feel like he's very intelligent on the pitch. Where whereas when I compare him to someone like Adama Traore, I feel like on the pitch he just looks clueless. Honestly, I, I feel like he does not know what to do, and that's the reason why I feel like you know him, his type of wingers are where, where, the football is moving away from that. But what do you think? I think a guy like Adama is is less technically gifted, so yeah. in team in a top team, as I said, with like something Pepe has struggled with is the like just the, the basics. Like not having them basics will keep a guy out of the top team or, or out of the top team regularly. Because we see a lot of the Pepe stands and all these complaining about Pepe not starting and stuff. And when you've been told by the manager that certain games Pepe hasn't been chosen simply because he lacks the ball retention you need against a low block and someone just being able to to constantly keep their first, even though we don't like William, I think him having that consistent first touch and just one one two and recycling the ball is is beneficial. And I think with Adama, he's he's looked well in that season for for um, Wolves when he got that nine assists directly to Jimenez himself, just because he was used as a massive outlet and. His pace and explosiveness, which I said was frightening, and no one could could deal with a lot of people. his whole career in the Premier League, in fact, or in English football. When he was at Middlesbrough and Wolves, people haven't been able to deal with the explosiveness and stuff. 
but his end product is so inconsistent that you can't count on a guy like Obama, for example. But the difference between him and Saka, I think Saka's intelligence is on a different level to most wingers in the world. I think Saka is a unique example because I think he plays too many positions or able to play too many positions, but his IQ isn't comparable to many. So I just think that he lacks the basics to to consistent to be consistent. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I want to basically now wrap up and but before we wrap up, I want to just pick, you know pick up on strikers because that's the last position we haven't even mentioned. So yeah. there's obviously um, there's different kind of strikers. We've got the target man, and we've got your tra- traditional number nines and. Like what is what is your favorite type of striker? Do you like target man, or do you like you know your fast pacey type strikers? You know, go ahead, Chris. Um, oh, for me, um, I prefer a, a, a different. I don't prefer the the target man. I know Curran loves the target man, but for he me, loves I, it. Yeah, he loves the Weghorst and the the Vlahovic. He says he loves them that them big <laughs> six, six foot six six foot four strikers. Be massive guy. Yeah, he loves it. And I, for me, I just prefer like a, a smaller, natural finisher, composed, pacey, explosive. Like my mm-hmm. preferable type of nine. It, um, in an example, maybe like in right now, Aguero, Martinelli, them mm. type. Of, the smaller ones, I think, for a striker, no matter what type of profile they are, I think you'd always look for are they natural? Are they a natural finisher? Are they hesitant in front of goal? Um, are they composed? Because you need composure from your striker, man. If your striker lacks composure, which Morata, who Morata is the prime example of having everything else but composure, and that that's <laughs> yeah. a lot of his like reputation because. He misses a lot of one v ones and a lot of big chances. So the composure is probably mm-hmm. key in a striker to succeed at the top level. All all types of strikers, and I I just think like movement again, the same as wingers, the off the ball intelligence in the box, yeah. out of the box, to create space for yourself for a striker has always been key. No matter how big you are, if you don't get space at all, you won't be able to do much. So the movement the confidence, composure, the the finishing ability and probably like athleticism is what I look for on the track. And and if they're able to, to play, like if you're looking at a four three three you need a complete striker who can create and like score mm-hmm. so like all around nines. I'm not sure the best in the world that probably is Kane. Do you guys agree? Kane is probably the, the most complete nine in the world okay. right now. I think the best is Lukaku. I'm, I'm guessing you don't like Aubameyang or Lacazette then, because you know everything that you've described right now is, is you know is completely. I, okay, so with uh, Aubameyang, yeah. it's a weird one because Aubameyang is like <laughs> his movement is elite. Don't get me, don't get it twisted. Like Aubameyang, Cavani, no. them types of striker, their movement in the in the box, in the in between the 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 goal line and the penalty spot are. Their movement is incredible, but with Oba, it's like I think he's limited in general play. Even though he's improved, yes. play, he's just so limited in general play. And with Laka, he's lauded for being able to pin the centre back, and that I just think that's overrated for Laka. I just don't. <laughs> I don't think he has the strength that people say he does. And well, I think Laka wants to like be Giroud. And he runs the... around like a grandpa, man. Yeah, and pin and stick his bum into centre backs and play around and stuff but you just can't <laughs> do it so like with Oba I can yeah. with Oba I may not love what Oba is I, I used to, with Oba like he has limits but he guarantees you in his worst he didn't just guaranteed me 14 goals so in his worst yeah. he's going to give me mm-hmm. 14 goals at Lacazette's best he's going to give you 14 goals so I'd rather Obama than Lacazette but I'd rather Martinelli okay. to both of them okay George I want you to, I want you to take me to the finish line Tell me your best tra- traits that you're looking for a striker, your ideal striker, and yeah, hit me. Really, well, re- really quickly, my ideal striker is Gabriel Martinelli. He is the perfect. If oh. I could grow a striker in a lab, it would be Gabriel Martinelli. Somebody who is absolutely elite over five, but also 15 yards, 
somebody who is a killer in the box, somebody who receives the ball and shoots on sight with a short back lift, somebody who creates space when there is none. And yeah. strikers for me are straight line runners. This is why he's actually not a winger. And I, this is the, one of the greatest things that I always say is he's very rigid in his lines and how he runs. He isn't a, able to shift as well, kind of I'm both like sides. You can, you can do it diagonally. Exactly. And so we're looking at, you know, and also lastly, he has one of the best aerial abilities in the world. Facts. Yes, and so yeah. if, if you're looking at having that on the wing, it makes zero sense to me. Um, why not just have somebody there who, you know, we, we have in profiles and get him the ball so that he can score. Um, look, for me, strikers, simply, I look at an alpha male. <laughs> it's so annoying and maybe Yerda, but like, Guys, I can I can talk to you about crates, about short back lifts, finishing, and bipedal finishing, all the fun buzzwords that everyone likes to say. But at the end of the day, what I love is a killer. And you yeah. know, for me, I I I just know that if he's one v one, I want him to bury it. Like, you know, yeah, and like for me, that's the most important thing for a striker. You know, when the moment comes, can you perform? And look, I do prefer an Aubameyang type over the the complete nine. I always do because I'm always a favor of movement. And, you know, Chris, you made a great point about, you know, in his worst season, he matched Lacazette's best, which he didn't even produce. He's never produced 14 league goals in his Arsenal career. Um, and, you know, Aubameyang did that in his worst career uh, season with us. So for me, movement solves much more, though, when things aren't going right. When things don't go right for Laka. Yeah. Not only does he not score, but he ruins the progression in midfield. When when Aubameyang isn't firing and isn't firing the goals, at least his movement pulls the opposition defense apart. So even at their worst, that type of striker affects play far more than a number nine who comes into midfield zones where I don't need that pulled apart. I've got midfielders to do that. So at their worst, they're not affecting zones of the pitch that I really need. So... I do prefer an Aubameyang type, but um, yeah, they need to be a killer, mate. Like Balogun, why I love him, and for all of like the little things that we can't see about pinning center backs and yada yada, he's a killer, mate. Like you give that guy yards, he's an alpha male that he doesn't care who you are, he will say I'm the best, and I will shove it in your face. And I, I love like, him. Like, in that game we played against Ibanian, they played four four two and. He commanded the center of the pitch. Like Laka went and, left wing. Do you know yeah, how rude like, that is? Wide, and I'm like, come on, Laka, man. You're like 29, bro. Like, <laughs> command your space, man. Do you know how rude that Strong is to have a youngster do. come in and say, Oi, I got this. Go out wide. Where you're you needed out there. <laughs> it's crazy that the confidence to do that. And with Balogun, I think Balogun is special in the sense that he can be your complete nine profile. Mm. But I think he can also be that because he has very good movement in the box and he could be an inside forward in the sense that he's got very good 1v1 dribbling, very good pace. Like Balogun is unique. Yeah. And to have for us to have two of the, the best profiles or young profiles or strikers in the world is immense because there were people shouting for Isaac or Isaac, however you say his name. And for me, I just don't want him because Balogun's Isaac, there. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about Tyrese John Jules no. in terms of a profile. So, like for me, but if you, yeah, Z to like answer the question essentially, yeah, <laughs> my my type is uh, Gabriel Martinelli. If I could grow my striker in a lap, it would literally be him, like yeah. to a degree, it both in counter press and his like yeah. mentality too, because it, he's a killer. But he also will help you lead the press, and I think that's really important in a in a new age striker. So the one thing that Oba struggles with is he doesn't have that desire and intensity off the ball. So his movement will still affect play, but he doesn't have that in defense. And so that's the one thing that Gabriel Martinelli adds to his bow and why I do believe that he's going to take over very soon from um, Pierre if he doesn't fix up. No, we need that to happen. We need that to happen very, very quickly, man. Honestly, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but with Batman, I never really liked him from the start, really, because... I don't know. There's something about you know me since I was an Arsenal since I started started supporting Arsenal. I've seen, um, I've seen um, Adi Bayo and I've seen Robert Van Persie per se, you know. And these two strikers, you know, they were absolutely lethal on the pitch. You know, they were what I what I'd like them to say is I call them a gunman. You know, they're killers. Yeah. 
then you know then we had players like Giroud and now Aubameyang. Where where, where Aubameyang crossed the line for me was his first few games at Arsenal when he was uh, one on um, one on one with um, Vincent Company, and he literally lost that duel. And I was like, this is this is not the striker that I wanted. He doesn't seem like he's assertive enough to you know. You know, use his strength and use use his pace to beat that man. I just feel like you know, there's not the, he doesn't have that killer killer instinct. I think last se- um, two seasons ago, when in, during the FA Cup run, we saw a bit of that, but that was just that was just probably the best time. Uh, other than that, man, honestly, I don't know. It's, he's not the type of striker that you know I, I'd like at Arsenal. Um, even though he got us the goals, we need a gun man, and if we can get Gabriel Martinelli or Balogun up and running. I'm all for it. I'm all for it, honestly. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we're coming to it was the end of the podcast. I mean, we've spoken mm-hmm. quite a bit. Do you guys have any last thoughts? Or Chris? no, mate. This was just really great. Like, I'm glad to like. Hopefully, people can see where I'm coming from. I hope people can see that it's a lot more yeah, of an yeah. arduous. That it's not just simple. The one thing I wanted to get across was that it is a lot more meticulous. Like we don't just use buzzwords for big themes, that there are specific things that we look for in different positions. And it is a very long process that the club and these things look for. It's not as simple as saying, I need gold. Let me get the 15 top goal scorers in the world and let's choose one of those. Um, Yeah. And and so I think scouting is a very long, complex process, but hopefully we broke it down so easily for everybody to uh, understand and yeah. this was one of my fave you know i'm a nerd like that so i love this stuff <laughs> yes. yeah no i mean to be fair we are we are definitely going to have more podcasts like this about scouting you know different you know different leagues and different positions and i feel like we, we should have specialized podcasts just for those positions you know this was probably a brief overview but you know that's to come yes chris what were you saying yeah for me like i, I think it was good to really show what like actually what I actually look at in terms of each different position and how they differ because we have said how they differ and who are ideal types of that prospect or position is in world football right now and I think we did dive into like Balogun, Martinelli and John Jules and if you want to hear more on our thoughts on yeah. that I think you should do you should check out the youth podcast we did because we have gone in depth on the Arsenal youth. Yeah. So yeah, like for me that's a pretty good one. I think there'll be more I think we'll do more of this like how we actually look at players because I think people would like to know how George has looked at Rido Baku or someone like that. Or how we analyze certain positions in our team and make up what you want for the future. So this is good for people to hear this and maybe think why do they love certain players. So yeah, thanks for tuning in and listening to me. Today, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, on that note, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, I had Chris, um, if you're watching on YouTube, he's over to the left, obviously. And we've got George, the mastermind, and myself, Pri- Private Arsenal Z. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to listen to the um, if, if you want to tune into our channel as well, subscribe on Ball of a Passion. We're on Spotify, Apple Music. Funnily, funnily enough, we don't actually advertise the Apple Music one, but we should do actually, guys. So keep that in mind. Um, but on that note, it's a good one from me. And yeah, that's it. Take care.